some old terms terms these just to remind ourselves what we did the last term we we prepared ourselves a lot we talked a lot about complex numbers and we need them this term so in particular when we discussed the regular construction of the regular pentagon we used the five solutions of this equation so the five numbers and we had introduced the cosine and the sine and it was very important to us that the cosine and the sine had that uh, gave numbers that satisfied this equation when you put a five here. And what we stressed was that one was somewhat anomalous from an algebraic point of view, whereas the others all satisfied this equation. And in a certain sense, it was the only equation that these numbers satisfied. And there are these five numbers represented geometrically as we can represent complex number as we can represent complex numbers. For the regular heptadecagon, we had something similar, except that we had 17 points. But they were, again, like that, those 17 points. So we emphasize these particular complex numbers, where we had 2 pi k, and instead of dividing by 5, as we did here, we divide by 17. So we'd partition the circle into 20, in 17, excuse me, equal arcs. And what we study in both these cases, we study numbers of this form. So a1 times z1 plus a2 times z2 plus a3 times z3, and so on, z1, z2, z3. And we use any fraction, a1, a2, and a, a1 was any fraction, a2 was some other. And what we understand and examined was the collection of algebraic symmetries of these numbers. Now, one case that we didn't uh, treat, simply for, because it was too simple, was the case of third roots of unity. They would have come up if we had discussed in any detail the construction of the of an equilateral triangle, so a regular polygon with three sides. And those are these three complex numbers. We didn't. So those are things that we did. We did over the uh, fall for the fall. And although they were of interest themselves, they were also, in some sense, preparatory for this material. So this one we didn't discuss in such length because we didn't bother to discuss. We didn't, we didn't stop, really, to discuss the construction of the equilateral triangle. That's something that, in some sense, that you might have done when you were in high school. You might not have done. Now, let me go back, since a few more people have come, and say, I have brought today two sets of notes, one, some more of those that I gave out last time. So if anyone didn't receive the notes last time and would like one, he should just tell me right now and I'll give them to him. All right. Oh, that's And also some more for uh, all right. All right. So let me, and I have some more for today. So let me give you three while you're while you're there. Now, who else? I'm sorry to. Did you pass one behind you? Yeah, just hang on. All right. Oh, so if anyone else would like one, he can just come up and take it from over here. All right, so we had intended to profit from our experience in the fall in order to introduce these numbers and to study them. Now, as far as the Q, if we just take these three numbers, so the three cube roots of unity, we again discard the first one is not so important and we're interested in the last two 
And these aren't quite the last two. One should have a plus here, and the other should have a minus here. Except they're almost. All right, so this could be a mi very well be a minus. So there should be two different numbers. They are well actually, uh, I, that's worse than I thought. Z1 and Z2, I'm now thinking of as this point and this point. So Z1 over here is this point. Z2 over here is this point. Uh, the, the we remove one. So they both satisfy this equation. Now it's uh, similar to the previous ones, except since 5 has been replaced by 3, this goes from z squared plus z plus 1 equals 0. And they can be solved. It's a quadratic equation. So we see that these two numbers are equal to this. So comparing signs, we see that this is that. So in particular, the cosine of 2 pi over 3, if you didn't know it, is equal to minus 1 half. And the sine 2 pi over 3, if you didn't know it, is equal to the square root of 3 over 2. So this number I now call alpha. As I say, this is just because it's, I'm going to, I just want a single one. I could use, I've used z2, but that doesn't matter. So I've taken over a notation from others, but that doesn't matter. And we're now, and now we're interested in quite different properties of these numbers. And if we were studying Fermat's equation for higher power, for n equal 5 or n equal 17, remember at the moment we're studying it for 3, we would be interested in all of these numbers as before. Or for example, n minus 1 would be 4, so there'd be 4 terms if n was 5, or there'd be 16 terms as before if n was 17. So we're studying, in some sense, the same numbers as we studied when we constructed, say, the regular pentagon or the regular heptadecagon. But our point of view is somewhat different. What is our new point of view? Well, it's over here. I'm going to write the, instead of using z1 and z2, I'll use alpha. z1 is, is alpha, and then z2, which is z1 squared, is alpha squared. Remember, alpha squared, because of this equation, alpha squared is minus, and I put this part over to the other side, it's minus alpha, minus 1. Put that in. So a1 is what I would have written is a1z2 plus a2, a1z1 plus a2z2. I now write as a plus b alpha, where a and b are related to a1 and a2 in this way. And this will be now be my notation. I just will forget about z1 and z2, but these are the same numbers. Now, what we have to do, before we were interested in the symmetries, and now we didn't really care whether something was in any sense integral or not. So we allowed a and b or a1 and a2 to be any fraction. But now, what's relevant is somehow the notion of prime, and not just the notion of prime in the ordinary sense, so not just numbers like 2, 3, and 5, but the notion of prime for numbers of this form. And we'll see that the notion of prime depends upon the numbers that we apply it to. And since primes in the ordinary sense are integers, we want to use only integral numbers of this form. Now, we don't, in fact, know. We don't have any really general definition of an integral number of this form. But a naive expectation would be that this kind of number is integral if the coefficients a and b are integral. Now it turns out this is both the correct naive notion and the correct notion when one has some kind of general criteria. But so we'll just take the numbers of this form. We'll study them. We'll study when they're prime, when they're not prime, when they can be factored. Uh, and just to give them a whole collection of these numbers a name, I used to introduce this z of alpha. Z usually stands for integer. And what we want to stress is that this particular domain of these numbers, so we could do the same thing for 5 or 17. And this domain is particularly in simple for n equals 3. So it's really appropriate to begin with that. But we'll have to come to it later for other powers of n. Now, what did it, I'm repeating some of the things I think that I did. No, I'm not. I'm sorry. I, this is my transition. This is all new. So, one of the things in particular that was obscure last time—it's not obscure to mathematicians, and that's—but uh, that I went through too 
too fast and that some people had to examine on their own and understand on their own later is the notion of a norm. Now, the norm is in some sense, is a measure of, in a certain sense, a measure of size. And the norm of, this, of a complex number like this would be the square of the distance from the origin. And uh, so that's an old picture where we were thinking about complex numbers. And here's the origin, where 0. And here's 1 plus i. This distance is the square root of 2. This distance, for example, is 1. And this is 1. So the square of the distance from the origin by the Pythagorean theorem is just the sum of the squares of these two coordinates, x and y. This is the point x and y. That means the distance x out here and the distance y up here. So this length, which is the hypotenuse, has a square which is equal to this squared plus this square. And algebraically, it's convenient not to take the square root, just to remain with the square of the distance. So the norm of alpha itself, this is, a co this is alpha with cosine 2 pi over 3, that's i sine 2 pi over 3. And we discovered that the cosine was 1 half, so it squares a quarter. The sine was square root of 3 over 2, so it squares 3 quarter. So the norm of alpha itself is 1. And so is that of alpha bar, because we just to get alpha bar, which is minus 1 minus alpha, what we do is just change the sign that's in front of the sign. One other thing I wanted to, I had here that I wanted to show you. Maybe I can do it this way. This is actually a picture for later, but let's have bring it out now. So complex numbers we think of as points in the plane. And the back, let's, let me just orient this, the, the back uh, hexagon is not important. Those are all, you think of that going all the way to infinity, and those are the points in this domain z of alpha. There's the point 0, there's the point alpha, there's the point alpha bar, which is also alpha squared, the reflection in there. There's the point minus 1, that's the point minus alpha, the coordinates opposite opposite to those of alpha, and this would be the point minus alpha squared. And you see all those points are the distance 1 from the origin. And then out here we have some other ones that are farther away, and so on. Yeah. But in particular, we'll I'll point this out again, I pointed out last time, the points in the domain z of alpha that are a distance 1 from the origin, whose norm is 1, are these six points. These are what we call the units. And here are, as I said, here is one of them, which is here, and alpha squared. The angle is, you realize this angle is doubled, is here. And minus alpha is here. So I want to say a little bit more about norms, because we used them last time. And as I said, we used, I, went in, I discussed, went, started to talk about them too quickly. Now, there are, we stressed before that there was a symmetry of the collection of all complex numbers, which just sent a plus bi to a minus bi. And that's because I said that it's algebraically, i and minus i are indistinguishable. We only can distinguish them when we represent them geometrically in the plane. <coughs> we represent them geometrically. We represent, it, we represent i above the axis of abscissus or above the x-axis, and we represent minus i as lying below it. But that's the convention. But it is a symmetry, and that we verified before, respects multiplication. So if I, if I apply the symmetry to w and to z, or this, I'm sorry, this, this bar, I should have, I don't know quite why the tech did so badly. This bar should have been z 
because r employed bar was supposed to be over all of z times w. So if we want to take the bar of a product, that's the same as the product of the bars. So that means that since the norm of this is just the no z times w times the, the bar of z and times w, then we just get z times w times z bar times w bar, z z bar, w w bar. It's the norm of z times the norm of w. So this norm has the property that the norm of the product is the product of the norms, if you like. Now, it turns out, and this we use, that this formal property appears for other de definition of norms. There's one specific definition for numbers when you think of them as complex, but we can introduce it in other ways. And this is what I used last time. It doesn't hurt to repeat it. Suppose I consider not this domain z of alpha, which involves the square root of minus 3, so i times the square root of 3, but as in the example a domain in which I use I used the square root of 3. Now, here's where I use the square root of minus 3. Any number a plus b alpha is of uh, this form, because alpha is, is minus 1 half plus 1 half the square root of minus 3. Now, what I observe is, you don't have to worry too much about this, minus 3 is replaced by 3. That's all right. And that there's an incidental point that we don't have to worry about, that for some reason or other, in z of alpha, these coefficients may be half integer, b over 2 and a minus b over 2, <coughs> whereas in this domain, I usually keep them to be integer. So we don't worry about that. <coughs> but what? I hope it's not vice versa. No, the square root of minus 3, a plus b alpha with a and b integral leads me, for example, if a is 1 and b is 1, what I get here is 1 half plus 1 half the square root of minus 3. All right, so if minus 3 is replaced by 3, that's the important point. But in a new domain, I take c and d to be whole numbers. Uh, so I just mentioned why this, it just happens, why that I, in z of, if I use the square root of minus 3, I can have numbers whose norm is 1 and which are half integral, which wouldn't happen with the square root of 3. What is important is that in this domain, there's again a symmetry. This is a funny kind of symmetry. It sends the square root of 3 to the square minus the square root of 3. And you can see it's perfectly reasonable because the only property of square root of 3, which is pertinent, is that its square is 3. So algebraically, and in res res with respect to rational coefficients, you can't, there's no property of this number that this number doesn't have. So if you're, if you're just, if, so if you're coming from the country of rational coefficients and you cannot distinguish between these two numbers, you have, they have mm. different symbols, just as i and minus i have different symbols, but that symbol is only a convention. And because you have these symmetries, because you ha then the product that pr if I apply the symmetry to the product, that's the same as applying the symmetry to each term and taking the product. This is c minus d, the square root of three uh, ran over. So I apply the symmetry t to this product. I just put a minus sign here. That's the same as taking the product of the two terms that I obtain when I put a minus here and a minus here. And similarly, is true, something similar is true for the sum. If I, if I take the sum and then put the minus, by the way, the, uh, ooh, my ear. We can see that this, this parentheses, oh, oh no, I'm sorry, that's, that's all right, that's, that's all right. No, it's here that that is wrong. Okay, so I take the sum and I apply the symmetry, which means I replace square root of minus three by minus the square root of minus three. That's the sum of these two things in which I put a minus here and a minus here. Now, what we use in this particular in the study of this particular number, we used a different norm, and it was this norm, the norm obtained by taking 
a plus the b square root of 3 times a minus b square root of 3. And that, or uh, uh, there's an example in which we compute the norm. But it's, it's a different norm. It's not the norm of these numbers as complex numbers. This number, square root of 3, is an ordinary real number. So this is an ordinary real number, and this is an ordinary real number. And the, 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 we apply to, when you apply the symmetry to this, you obtain that. Now, you see that, we be well, that we're well advised not to think of these two numbers as real numbers, because here, 1 plus the square root of 3 is approximately that. 1 minus the square root of minus 3 is approximately that. But these approximations are neither here nor there. What is important, that their product, which is the norm of either in this new sense of norm, is minus 2. Another example would be 17 minus 10 to the square root of 3. Under the symmetry, it becomes that. So the norm of this or of this is the product of the 2. Minus 11, but these numbers as decimals are approximately that and that. So it's imprudent when studying the algebraic properties of the square root of 3, or minus square root of 3, for that matter, to think of them in terms of their decimal expansion. It's, they're just symbols. <coughs> Now, what I want to stress in response to a question is because, in some sense, I called this identity into question. I didn't call the identity into question as an identity. It's certainly true. And the question that I wanted to discuss and was whether it was remarkable, because I think it's, it's, it's a pertinent question for us. It's, it looks strange. And what I wanted to stress was that this identity is striking, not because it expresses any particular mathematical truth. That's what I wanted to stress. I, I, I'm, I will introduce some reservations later. But simply because we don't see offhand that this number is a cube. So we don't have the good sense to say that, here, I'm taking the cube root of a number that's a cube. If this said, it was, if, if this, was this said the cube root of plus the cube root of 3, the, the, the cube root of 8, plus, say, the, the cube root of 27 was equal to 5, we wouldn't be surprised because we know that the cube root of 8 was 2 and the cube root of 27 was 3, and so we wouldn't be surprised. But here we have two numbers that we don't agree, that we don't, not which, but that we don't recognize are, are cubes. All right. But once we see that these numbers are cubes, as we did last time, then this is the cube root of a cube, so it's 1 plus the square root of 3, plus the cube root of another cube, so it's plus 1 minus the square root of 3, and their sum is 2. And no one would suggest that this identity, which is the same as this, once we perceive that these are cubes, is remarkable. In some sense, it's trivial. Now, that said, I just include an afterthought. I think in fairness, it's best to include an afterthought. Because we're going to, this afterthought, of course, has to do with things that we, Renaissance development that we didn't discuss at all. Namely, formulas, and this was, these were the beginnings, and these are things that are now incorporated in the Galois theory, but they're formulas for the for solving not quadratic equations, but cubic equations. And this particular formula, which was discovered by Del Ferro, is that if I want to solve this particular cubic equation, then I set delta equal to this expression, and then a solution will be x equal to the cube root of the square root of delta plus q over 2 minus the cube root of square root of delta minus q over 2. And what Varajan says is that this is a very beautiful formula, as indeed it is. And it took, you discover, as you can see, a couple of millennia before math mathematics to arrive at it. And it's still a beautiful formula. And if we apply it to this particular equation, which clearly has the root 2, 8 plus 12 is equal to 20, it yields this identity. So this 
at first it's a very surprising identity. Right? If, if you get at it that way, and remember that this is quite early on, long before Kumar and Galwa, and so that I don't think you could have expected anyone in the 15th or 16th century just to say when he saw that, oh my goodness, that's a cube. You're just pulling the wool over my eyes. There's, there's not nothing special about that. No, it looks quite remarkable. And uh, so in fairness, I think we should, that from our point of view, in some sense, this identity is not to be regarded as remarkable once we know how to, how to once we understand a little bit about these kind, this kind of absurd, but nonetheless, one can imagine that from other points of view, it is particularly remarkable. As I say, I don't, I'm not familiar with the response to such formulas at the time. <coughs> Indeed, and I think what we can learn, and that was my original, from this identity, is that we re in order to work with these numbers, well, it says the only familiarity with the ideas of Kummer and Galois that made me suspicious, suspicious, and that the reason for introducing this example was just to show that for someone unfamiliar with what might be called higher mathematics or modern algebra, uh, oh, let, let me, you can read that. I'm, I'm losing track of what I wrote, but okay. Well, what I'm saying is that it, it's not that those unfamiliar with the, the, the more modern theory have no right to be astonished, but I wanted to emphasize that calculations within this domain, and those are the kind of calculations we have going to have to make, are not easy. We need some, ex we need some experience. Now, what Kummer does when he, he's going to consider not only Fermat's problem, not only for three, but for any integer, so he's going to replace solution of this equation by more something more general, the solution of that equation, and the number n will be an arbitrary prime, one of these. And it turns out that things start to change in a particularly drastic way at 23, and then don't change back. And then the domain z, z alpha is different in each case, because alpha is the solution of a different equation. And there are two difficulties up here, one for n equal 5, and the one for n equal 5, someone already discovered, in a certain sense, when in the exercise, and that is that there are no longer just a finite number of units that cause trouble. We'll come back to the units, but we introduced them last time. And we discovered that for n equals 3, there are only 6. For n equal 5, they're infinite in number, uh, for any n bigger than 3, and that causes a lot of problems. The second is that from 23 on, there is no longer unique factorization. Now, we don't know yet what unique factorization might be. We haven't thought about it enough. So we better, well, we don't know what, <laughs> what problems there might arise because it doesn't exist. And what we'd best do is to understand it first, in the simplest case, the difficulties the units cause, and what advantages accrue because there is unique factorization. As I say, we have to even know what unique factorization is, and we have to know how it can be exploited to prove Fermat's theorem. So these are our tasks. And uh, then I just go on to point out that I think I'm from an expository point of view, I made a mistake in, uh, in introducing Euclid. I think it's amusing, but it just obscures the real issues at this point. All right, so I, I'm still making the transition. I'm still doing what I thought I might have done, should have done last time. But now I want to do the transition in a slightly different way because I think there was, around this time, a genuine historical transition. And so I give you some names and dates. Now, Gauss, we're already familiar with Gauss. We already know that he published the Discus Discussiones when he was early, uh, when he was very young, when he was 23 or 24. And then these are names of people who came after him. Now, Lamey is there doesn't really belong. First of all, LeMay is, was not particularly a number theorist. His excursions he was probably primarily interested in mechanics. But as I pointed out last time or the time before, he had, he solved, he proved Fermat's theorem for n equals 7. 
by a method that uh, was not to be the, the successful one that was used in many more cases by Coomer. Uh, he proved it for n equals 7 quite late in life. Well, say, uh, not so late, I guess it was about 1837, 1840. Uh, when at that, that time, Dirichlet had already earlier done something for n equal 5, not by the approach of uh, Coomer, but by a different approach, something similar to that of, uh, similar to that of Lamé. And then, but otherwise, apart from Lamé, what we have are basically are the immediate heirs of Gauss. Uh, Abel, we mentioned before in connection with the Lemnus gate. We don't need to mention in connection with Fremont's problem. And then, of course, we have here three contemporaries. And uh, Kronecker is almost a contemporary. He was a student of Kummer. Eisenstein, we won't. Eisenstein was interested, and I'll come back to that, in certain aspects of these domains, Z of alpha, and well, we'll come back to Dedekind for another reason later. So we will come back to these names, but we just I want to stress using these names that there was an historical transition. And these are, they're in the notes, so you have them. I just draw attention to these two articles on Kummer that you, we won't refer to them again, but they're useful. Now, so what I want to say is there is an historical transition on which we it's worthwhile. I, I would like to spend some more time, but that would involve acquiring more familiarity with the, with the literature, and especially with the correspondence. But I can be brief. But let me just show you what it is, what's interesting to contemplate um, when thinking about this period are the close, let me just tell you this, is, is the close personal and mathematical relations between some of these people. Um, in particular, who were, so to speak, Gauss was a distant figure, but these people were all either in touch connection, some or other, with Berlin, for a while at least, these, these three, and they were personally close and scientifically close. You can see, if, if you look, this is, if you look, Kummer outlived them, them all. If you look, the Jacobi, both Jacobi and Dirichlet died young. They died, Jacobi before Gauss, Dirichlet afterwards. And here's the, the speech that uh, Kummer, who was left, um, gave you know, uh, after, uh, uh, upon the death, after the death of Dirichlet. And what you said, that he's, he observes that these three people went very fast, one right after the other, the three greatest the German mathematicians of his time. And that, uh, where am I here? In any case, I just, what he stresses, what he stresses is, is the personal relations between Jacobi and Dirichlet, and of course he himself had relations to close relations to Jacobi and Dirichlet, but above all he had close relations with Kronecker, and we'll we'll come back to, some, to at least one of his letters to Kronecker. It's just just that it would be fun in thinking about this time to think about the young people who were the heirs of, of Gauss, think about their personal and mathematical connections, but we won't have time to do that. But there was this transitional period. But the tr and they were inspired by Gauss. And what we see is that they weren't necessarily, or at least largely, inspired by what we've discussed, already discussed, namely by the construction of the regular heptadecagon. We uh, seen that this construction involved the use of these numbers. But these numbers are used for other things as well. And let's just talk for a bit about the other things they're used for uh, to make the transition light, because this, this other use that played the more important role at the beginning, sort of in the hands especially of Jacobi, Kummer, and Eisenstein. That's why I mentioned Eisenstein, who, although belonging to a younger generation, was uh, some <coughs> person somewhat apart.
And let me ask, so if the long quadratic reciprocity is otherwise not of concern to us, but it, it's important uh, thing, it's important if for similar, where am I here? For, so, so let's think about it just a little bit. I'm going to tell you what the law of quadratic reciprocity is. I, it's, it's a law whose consequence, which was extended and generalized, and these are consequences of these extensions and generalization also played into the ultimate solution of Fermat's theorem. So it's not uninteresting from that point of view, although after the day we will come back to it, but only briefly and only incidentally. So I'm going to draw it to your attention to uh, special cases of this law. So just write down these numbers x squared plus 1. I wrote them down for x running from 1 to 20, but we could uh, continue. So this sequence may or may not appear remarkable. You can see 2, 5, 10, 17, 26, and 37, and so on. So let's factor each of these numbers. So we factor the first as 2. We factor the second. That's again 5. Factor 10 is 2 times 5. 17 is already factored. 26 is 2 times 13. 37 is already prime. 50 is 2 times 5 times 5. 65 is 5 times. When, am I, 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 sometimes I got into trouble here. So let's see. 41 is 2 times 41. Is 5 times 13. Excuse, okay. That's, I didn't see. So there's, a, there's an error there. All right, so you can continue. You can do the factorization yourself. But what do we observe? Well, 2 appears here. 2 is somehow exceptional. But otherwise, the primes that appear in these factorization all leave the remainder 1 upon division by 4. So there's 5, which is 4 plus 1. 17 is 4 times 4 plus 1. 13 is 3 times 4 plus 1, and so on. 41 is 4 times 10 plus 1. So in, and you, you will discover that if you continue, this particular phenomenon will persist. Let me do it again. x squared plus 3. So I write down these numbers. 1 plus 3 is 4. 4 plus 3 is 7. 9 plus 3 is 12. 16 plus 3 is 19, and so on. And I factor them. 4 is 2 times 2, 7 is 7, 12 is 2 times 2 times 3, 19 is 19, 28, I think there should be a comma here. So 28 is 2 times 2 times 7, and so on. Now, with the clue from the previous example, you can see here that I have two exceptional primes, two and 3. But if I leave those aside, all the other ones leave the remainder 1 when I divide by 3. 19, 3 times 6 plus 1. 7 is 2 times 3 plus 1. 13 is 4 times 3 plus 1. 67 is 12 times 3 plus 1. 20, no, I'm sorry, 22 times 3 plus 1, and so on. So we discovered another law which would be confirmed. And this particular law we'll probably even prove, but w which will be confirmed as we, if we continue the sequence. Slightly more mysterious case is x squared minus 3. If I do x squared minus 3, uh, you, you see the, the, our first observation doesn't apply. We, we eliminate 2 and 3 as somehow exceptional. And then we, we divide by 4, and we see we get 13, which leaves the remainder 1. 11, which means leaves the remainder 3. 23 leaves the remainder 3. 61 leaves the remainder 1. So we have both remainders. <coughs> There's no rule there. But our remainder is 1 and 2 upon division by 3. 13 leaves the remainder 1. 11 leaves the remainder 2, 23 leaves the remainder 2, 
61 leaves the remainder 1, and so on. So the rule is a little bit different. What you here's the rule. You see 13 leaves the remainder 1 upon division by 4, and the remainder 1 upon division by 3. 11 leaves the remainder 3 upon division by 4, and the remainder 2 upon division by 3. And that's, if you examine all of these numbers, primes, the prime factors, that's the rule. It never happens that a prime factor here leaves the remainder 1 upon division by 4 and 2 upon division by 3. Think about it a minute. I, I, I <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not having trouble. Tell me one. Tell me one. Tell me a num prime number with that property. Uh, think about it a sec. I can't think about it up here. Prime number. There are prime numbers that leave the remainder two upon division by four and one upon division by three, but they don't appear in this sequence, and they will never appear. Thank you very much. So five doesn't appear. All right. So that's a general rule, and it appears to be a general rule. And uh, there are other such general rules. So if I take expression x squared plus or minus p, p is a prime, and uh, I have similar expressions. For example, take 5, a number that just came up, x squared minus 5. You, you look at the list. You factor it. And you see, do you discover you have 11 and 31, which both leave the remainder 1, 59 that leaves the remainder 4, 19 that re leaves the remainder 4. So what happens here is that the primes that appear, with the exception of 2 and 5, all leave the remainder 1 the remainder 4 upon division by 5. They do not leave the remainder 2 or 3. So for example, 7 never occurs, because 7 leaves the remainder 2. 13 never occurs, because 13 leaves the remainder so these are, these are laws that were very, thank you, that were very, that had been discovered during the course, I suppose that Fermi was in some sense aware of them, but they had been discovered during the later part of the, of the that they had been emphasized at least during the 18th century, and in particular the general law had been formulated, but not proven by Legendre. So it was a question at the end of the 18th century to prove the general law, which we haven't even formulated. And that was Gauss's, usually regarded as Gauss's principal achievement in the Dispositionis. Uh, now, there are, there are higher, so-called higher reciprocity laws when I replace the 2 here by 3 or by 4 or by 5 and so on. Now, these numbers cannot even be formulated without cyclotomy. So cyclotomy is the study of these nth roots of unity. The cyclotomy indicates the fact that they're important for the division of the circle. So even the laws for higher powers of x are called reciprocity laws. Now, what, what, we're, what we're going to see, because we're really going to need this reciprocity law for this case. And so we're going to have to study it. And what we're going to see is that it's intimately connected with cyclotomy. As I said, cyclotomy is the study of these domains, C of alpha. Now, even the, quadra and I said, even the quadratic law is intimately related to cyclotomy. Now, here I have a confession to make. When I, when I thought about this, you know, one is reminded of a long distant past. And I don't know if anyone else felt this way, but I confess that as a student, and as I was a student, I was unaware, of course, uh, cyclotomy in general, and I was unaware of the history of the subject, and I wasn't particularly impressed by the law of quadratic reciprocity. I thought a law quadratic reciprocity belonged to amateur math mathematics, basically. And, and, and I, as I say it here, I wasn't, it wasn't my intention to be an amateur mathematician. I was hoping at that time, at least, to be a serious mathematician. And it was only later on that I realized that the law of quadratic reciprocity was, was important. And it was in reading a book that could not be recommended to any but mathematicians. That's Hermann Weyl's book on algebraic theory of numbers. Hermann Weyl 
wrote many books that I would gladly recommend to non-mathematicians, but there are many that, of course, that one <laughs> hesitates even <laughs> to recommend to mathematicians. But in this particular one, like many of his books, is a strange, a lumbering book, very philosophical. Hermann Weyl was inclined to be philosophical. And what he wanted to express was a certain kind of intellectual tension. I think as tension, I use the word, it's not conflict between two approaches to, not to the earlier theory, but to the later theory, two approaches, uh, one of which is associated to the name Kronecker, who is a student of Kummer, and the other, the last name in my earliest, earlier list, Stedekin. And what struck me, I was just thinking about this because I was preparing these lectures, is that that tension, I don't know that any mathematician in the room besides me feels it, uh, is, I think, still with us and I think still unresolved. So the tension is somehow sort of where in the theory of numbers do numbers end and geometry begin? Geometry is for mathematicians a strange subject. Uh, I won't try to explain to you what geometry is for mathematicians, but it's, kind of, it's, it's a funny kind of algebra. And the tension is not particularly pertinent to Kummer, uh, so we don't have to bring it up, but I think it has appeared again in the aftermath of the, new re of the final resolution of Fermat's theorem. And what I suggest, I won't go into details, this is just a thought that flashed through my mind and I want to leave the thought obscure, is that there are some mathematicians whom I will not name who are perhaps inclined to place now too high a hope on the geometry. But uh, okay. if that's an obscure statement, then I want to leave it. Uh, now, both what I should perhaps point out is that both Lagrange, who was an earlier 18th century mathematician, and Gauss were aware of possible applications of cyclotomy to Fermat's theorem. It was first applied to reciprocity laws, and it was these higher reciprocity laws that attracted the attention of mathematicians like Jacobi and Eisenstein, and also, at the in the beginning, Kummer. And, uh, but as I said, reciprocity laws are, were one, the second theme of Kummer, and they, in the hands of Hilbert and others, they became <coughs> important, and they remain important to this day, and as I said, they were not of negligible import for the final resolution of Fermat's theorem. Um, and so here is, uh, for example, that's not the way to do it. If you find, you can look apparently in Lagrange and you'll see explicit references. This is, these are taken from two pages of a paper that appeared in 1769. And you, you can't read it, so I have to read it for you. I just so this is the equation r to the n minus a to the a z to the n equals q to the m. What's relevant is that if you make a equals minus 1 and m equal n, you have Fermat's equation, r to the n plus z to the n equals a to the n. And what he, he says is that what's pertinent to this equation are the roots of the nth roots of unity, the solutions of the equation a to the power n minus 1 equals 0. And then he goes on to say, just three or four pages later, that because he's not going to go into it, so he won't stop to, he won't dwell on it, but he, he, ob he observes, he only observes that Fermat claims, and if, as you know in the in the, re in, in the comments in the uh, pages of Diofan, that uh, he has in general demonstrated that I, he cannot find a sum of two nth powers, which is again equal to an nth power, unless n is equal to 2. So if n is greater than 2, he can't do that. But as he observes that uh, Fermat didn't leave any demonstration. And actually, Fermat didn't leave in print or in any papers a demonstration, even for the case n equals 3 and n equals 4, where it appears more or less certain that he had one. 
But in any case, Lagrange, after pointing out that Euler had had to resolve these, they had to solve, had to demonstrate the theorem in these two cases anew because Fermat's proofs were not extant. Uh, draws the attention of mathematicians to this equation as meriting attention. So that's uh, and uh, and what is what I wanted to emphasize is that he was aware, in some sense, that cyclotomy was a relevant uh, tool. Now, not only Lagrange was aware of this, uh, I don't have the original source, but I want, this is a page you, most of you, even the non-mathematicians will have heard of Bouvaki, who is, of course, a corporate entity. Uh, and in particular, he uh, has a book, you know, he had, in his books, there were uh, usually, uh, there was usually an historical appendix, and these appendices have, have been gathered. Now, it's, it's fairly well known that the person primarily responsible for these historical appendices was the uh, mathematician turned in his later life historian, Andre Zay, and these are very, very useful. This, uh, this book is very useful. There's a lot, there are a lot of tips, as places to go and things to read when you read these appendices. But, um, as I said, they're usefully collected. But in particular, he points out in a footnote on one of these pages that Gauss had looked at Fermat's theorem for n equals 3 and for n equals 5, and he was prepared to use cyclotomy in order. He, he could use cyclotomy to resolve it for n equals 3, thus giving a different proof than Euler, and he claimed he could do it for n equals 5, and by cyclotomy, which is a different method than Dirichlet used later, and then he stops. Uh, they himself seems, by the way, to be a, a little bit ambiguous about what Euler did and what Euler didn't do. Sometimes it's suggested that Euler left a small gap in the study of this equation, x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed, but if you look through his works, as Zay points out elsewhere, you will find that the gap is implicitly filled. I don't know quite why he's accusing Euler here of a lapse. All right, so that's um, that was the digression. That's perhaps what I should have done rather than uh, to talk about Euclid. Now I have to try to pick up the train of thought where I left it. Well, if I can last time. I don't have too much time, but, and I won't. So I think that all we can do now is just come back to a few minutes that remain. And I'll try to resume the train of, of thought from before. But you recall that I left you with an exercise. to show why that isn't remarkable. In other words, to show why that is a Q. And uh, as I said, at least one person did the exercise, and the person was doing the exercise implicitly discovered something important about the, f the domain I get when I use the cube root of 13 rather than the square root of minus 3, and that is that in this domain there are an infinite number of units, but that wasn't part of the exercise. So uh, let's just do it. We have just time left to do it. So we do what we did last time. We compute the norm. So the norm of this involves replacing the square root of, min of 13 by the square root of minus 13. Put in a minus 2, we discover that the norm is minus 52, which is 4 times 13. 25 is minus 27. It is indeed a cube. Now, we can look for a number whose norm is minus 3. One suggests itself minus 3. 
But if I try to use that in here, then I find the sum is 14 and not 1. And the difficulty, in some sense, the implicit difficulty with this exercise, and the reason I thought it was an exercise, is that it turns out that when I take the square root of 13, as with the square root of minus 3, integer numbers can, ha can be half integers. They can have half, half integer coefficients. So in order to get at this number, of which this is a cube, it turns out we have to put in a half for the first coefficient because we want the sum of this plus the sum of the same thing with the minus here to be 1. That means that this has to be a half. So whatever we put in here, the gain here, we get twice it here. So what is even a little bit less clear and more doubtful in this particular example is that we're going to discover that the this number, which is a, seems to be integral, is the cube of a number which has a half here and something else here and therefore appears not to be integral. And that's, and that's because of the subtlety, the notion of, of integrality, so being, an, uh, being a whole number, for, for thirds, for expressions that aren't simply our normal integers, our normal whole numbers, our whole normal fractions, but have thirds in them. So we need this, which tells us we have a half, and then we need the norm to be minus 3. So that tells us to solve this equation, minus 13 d squared. So, so, so b is, e is also equal to 1 half. So this number we're looking for is apparently 1 plus the square root of 13 divided by 2. And so as I said, that's all right. So, and then indeed, one half plus one half the square root of thirteen does has a, as as cube. When one checks, writes this out, it has this number, which was the number we wanted to find: five plus two times the square root of thirteen. And and this, as I said, raises this question, and a que it's a question that we don't resolve. All I observe is that this number, it's just in passing, this is a number new, and this is a number new. And they both satisfy this equation, x minus mu, x minus mu equals 0. And that's an equation. In spite of the fact that mu and mu don't seem to be quite integral, they do satisfy an equation with integral coefficients. And that means that in spite of appearances, with any kind of correct definition, they have to be treated as integral. Anyhow, that's the solution to the exercise. Uh, the next time, I'll come back to took up the train of thought from last time, namely I'll uh, discuss this domain V of alpha in more detail. And if anyone came in late, I, I point out once again that there are the notes from last week that, uh, which I didn't have enough, and new notes from this week.